It's midnight. Cedelia, <laughs> John, I want to thank you very much. This is a great opportunity. I always tell folks, it's not what's at the end of the name, it's what's in the heart. And I truly mean that. You know, uh, as we continue to grow, I, I remember when we first moved to New York, uh, we were supposed to be Democrats. We were told that we were Democrats. At the time, we were told the same thing. And when you start to see the values, the Republican values, you realize as you get older, no, you're in the wrong place. And if you, just because you're Hispanic doesn't mean you need to be a Democrat. Just because you're black, you need to be a Democrat. No. It's what party has your values. And some might be, that, you know, we just don't have, we can't help you. But that's where the decision should be made. Not off the of nationality, not off the of color, not off of anything else. And I learned that early on in life. And it's, it's Party, it's what's in the heart, and if you don't, if you're if we're closer to you than the Democratic Party, and but there's things you don't like, vote, run for, you know, get involved, and get yourself heard, because you're right. We're never gonna, we we might not be a hundred and ten percent of what you want from us, but I promise you this: we're willing to listen, and we're li willing to help, and that's and that's what the, the best that anybody can say. I am so blessed, I have to tell you, that if, if Rosemary was a legislator eight years ago, I probably would have a full head of hair right now. <laughs> <laughs> I went through eight years of turmoil. You know, you vote one way, the other person votes the other way. So when I'm standing on the floor of the House to support an issue for Monroe County and vote for it, and the other guy votes against it, and just think about this for eight years. So you had two legislators, but you had a separate vote all the time. So what kind of power do we have? As we grow, you've got to vote as a team. And it's happening more and more. And let me tell you, she's educating me. And we share so many ideas, because guess what? The woman's perspective is so unique. You know, I look at one, see one thing, and Rosemary sees something else. And believe me, we're a good team. And we're doing good things in Harrisburg, and you're gonna see good things happen here. I know that Tom wants to talk about the budget, but briefly, I just want to tell you a couple things that have happened. I'm after PennDOT to try to fix or slow down the traffic on Main Street, on I-8. I know that's a dangerous, dangerous location. I'm aware of the, the uneven pavement there. Something needs to happen there. So either they're gonna have to slow it down or, or, or do something there to try to get, and get that done as quick as possible. All of I-8 will be paved from Blakesley to 380 yeah. to, from, and, 380 to the double what again, east and west. They're starting tonight, they are right now on the eastbound side. They're starting the eastbound. I'm trying to get eastbound done first, why? When the water park opens up, it's, and, and we're still, because it's all gonna get done at night, those folks on the water park are gonna get on the highway and do a gridlock in, in, in Tannersville and everywhere else because of the one lane. So I wanna get that done completed, because it's all gonna get done at night, so that they'll be able to get out and then, then come to the other side and get the other side done. It, it's something that needs to be done, and I know our roads in Monroe are hurting right now, but just think this. Once I-80 gets totally paved, and 33 is totally paved, PennDOT, local PennDOT, will not be on those two roadways, and we'll be able to concentrate on our local roads. There are a couple of things happening, 611 from Scott Run all the way up to the, to the Sanofi there. That road is in bad shape, we all know that. That road is gonna get widened with dedicated turning lanes and two lanes in both directions. Right now, we're about 75, 80% finished with the engineering. After that, it, we're gonna have to acquire some land because in some locations, the road's gonna have to get widened to create the left-hand dedicated lane because we don't want anybody stopping, at a stopping there to make a left-hand turn and, it's, and out there in the, in the travel lane and get hurt. That's why I had close to one lane. We had 150 accidents there and five fatalities over a five-year period. So I said a few years ago, until we get this road proper the way it's supposed to be, we're gonna go down to one lane. And it's worked. We've, we've had very minor fender benders there, but nothing like we had before. It's a much safer road. When we put the final touches to it, that's gonna be a great road. The Marshalls Creek Bypass is ongoing. So that's gonna help the, the eastern part of the, of the state, of the, of the county as well. Now the budget. $27.3 billion, that's what our budget is. What's happened to us the last few years? We have a $4 billion shortfall that this governor has to deal with. And that's a tough, <coughs> tough amount of amount. The 
prior governor had three billion dollars worth of stimulus. Money that came from the federal government that came from the state. That money was used and put right into the budgets and, and maintained spending levels. In some cases, what that money did was, was put into, let's say for example, education. I don't mind putting money into education, but what he did was, he put the money in and he grew the education budget the last three years, especially the last two, because in the last two, he put about 650 million or so in both those two years and expanded the budget. By doing that, this year, this governor doesn't have the luxury of that stimulus money. He's actually funding schools at what they were funded two years ago without stimulus. So he's getting beat up in the press and he's getting, he's really taking a tough, a tough beating, but what people don't understand, the money that went in the prior two years was not state revenue. It was revenue that came from the federal government, and I call it candy from D.C. In 2009, on the House floor, I warned the legislators on how they used that candy from D.C., that stimulus money. And I stated in, that, in those comments is, if you put it into school budgets and you grow the school budget, in two years, you're looking at the mother of all tax increases. You can go on the website, hit YouTube, fuzzy math, and you'll get it in there. I also, a week, uh, two or three weeks ago, repeated it at an appropriations hearing with the Secretary of Education. We're not getting our fair share. I don't have to tell you guys, you know. What's happened over the years, since 1991, we're facing a huge issue in this, in this area. A bill was voted on in Harrisburg, it was hold harmless, based off of, of a 1990 census. All of the areas in the, com in the Commonwealth were guaranteed from 1990 on that they would be funded at those levels. So when you say that, you're funded at those levels, if you stayed the same, you did okay. If you lost population, boy, did you make out. Because could you imagine like Philadelphia lost two legislators and they're still getting funded at the 1990 census? They're really making out. But if you grew, like us, where the population in the schools tripled, it really put a huge burden on us. You go on the website, you'll see a nine minute clip me talking about the issues here in Monroe with the Secretary of Education. At the end, I pleaded, we need your help. 